chat in a few minutes. Is everything good? Yep. All right. Great. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this month's Hat Parlor Chat uh, with Morris Jumel Mansion. Uh, for those of you uh, who have attended these chats before or who may not have, every third Wednesday of the month, um, we invite experts on a particular to speak on a particular theme that is connected with the history and the site of Morris Jumel Mansion, which is the oldest remaining house in Manhattan, uh, located in Washington Heights. This month, we are excited to explore the topic, clean water, disease, and the city, a brief history of old Croton Aqueduct with two friends from the old, two friends, friends of the old Croton Aqueduct, um, Leslie U. Walter and Tom Tarnowski. Um, so the program this evening, before we get into the nitty gritty details of clean water and the ongoing search for it uh, in New York City, I'm going to share a little bit about how our house connects with this topic and go over a few housekeeping uh, rules for us this evening. Um, so let me advance my slide. There we are. Um, so in case you didn't receive a notification message, um, we are recording as well as live streaming this webinar on YouTube. So uh, when you enter the webinar space, your video and audio should automatically be turned off. Uh, however, if you participate either by raising your virtual hand, typing in the chat, um, asking to be called upon in the Q&A, you will show up on the recording. Um, so be mindful of that. And if you're not comfortable with that, you are welcome to exit the meeting uh, if you're not comfortable being recorded. We will have this available on Morris Jumel's YouTube website after. Um, since we are on Zoom, our virtual parlor chat uh, will we'll begin with a few words by myself, um, Megan Burns, uh, the program manager at Morris Jumel Mansion, um, and Tom and Leslie. We will build in pauses uh, throughout tonight's presentation if you have any burning comments or questions you would like to share. Uh, we invite you to submit questions to the panel using the Q&A on your navigation bar. And if you're having some technical difficulties or you just have general comments or questions, uh, there will be an informal conversation going on in the chat. We are also setting aside um, 10 to 15 minutes at the end of our program before eight o'clock to open up the floor to questions from the audience. Um, and as always, I always feel like I'm on PBS or NPR when I make, when I get to this slide. Um, Morris Jumel Mansion is a nonprofit. Um, so if you are able to um, and enjoy programs like tonight's virtual parlor chat, uh, we invite you to make a donation to the mansion um, to try to help us keep as many of our educational and arts programming free to the public. So if uh, please consider making a gift today, you're welcome to text MJM to 44321, or uh, shortly in the chat, we will place a link to our donation page on the website. And uh, for anyone who contributes over $20, you'll be entered into a drawing to win a free family membership to Morris Jumel Mansion. So we're gonna sweeten the pot a little bit here for you. 
And of course, the virtual parlor chat is just one of many programs that we have going on, uh, both virtually and on site in Washington Heights. Um, so we invite you, we're, I can't believe we're already looking at September, um, to uh, our September 2nd concert with the Overlook String Quartet uh, called If the Stars Align. Um, that will be a free show. Uh, on September 2nd in the park, bring your own blanket and it will go from four to five. I also would like to invite you to next month's virtual parlor chat, um, exploring Tomba Francesa. I hope I'm remotely saying that correctly. Um, it is a French Haitian dance um, and we have special guests um, Catherine Tarosi from the New York Baroque Company, who will be speaking about the fascinating origins of this dance um, in uh, former French colony, Santa Domingue, uh, today is Haiti. So there's definitely a Jumel connection there. As there is with our next Con Edison Family Day on September 18th, where we will have Dancing with the Jumel's French Contra Dance. So um, definitely, if you um, have young children in your family or if you're a kid at heart and want to dance, please come join us. So setting the stage for tonight's connection between the mansion and the old Croton Aqueduct. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, this is an image of Morris Jumel Mansion today, which is the oldest remaining house in Manhattan. It was constructed in 1765 on the ancestral homeland of the Lenape people, Lenape Hoking, and most likely was constructed using the labor of enslaved individuals. Um, its name is twofold, referencing the first family, um, the, the British American Morris family who uh, commissioned the house as a summer property, as well as for the second major family to live there, the Jumel family, um, uh, Stephen Jumel, a French wine merchant and his, his American wife, Eliza. Eliza will feature heavily in tonight's presentation, <laughs> as will a sense of geography. So uh, we at the mansion are expanding our time frame of interpretation to go beyond this sort of traditional affluent white family chronology from 1765 to 1865 expanding it both again to include um, the indigenous inhabitants of this place and bringing that timeline up to the present. We're also expanding sort of the footprint of what we consider part of the mansion and its story to include a geographic area shown in red here, which is roughly 50 modern city blocks, a rough uh, footprint of the Morris and Jumel family estates. Um, and we're expanding again, um, some of the conversations we're having at the house, um, including bringing up the history of the mansion to talk about contemporary migration stories and urbanization. And the old Croton Aqueduct is a very key um, story in the evolution of this area, Washington Heights from countryside to um, an urban uh, center. So back for a minute to Eliza Jumel. So our connection to this story really comes through her as well as Aaron Burr uh, shown here. Now, what? how are these two connected? <laughs> Friends of the house may already know that Eliza married Aaron Burr. It was the second marriage for both. And they were married in the front parlor um, at the museum in the French parlor in 1833. Both were um, more advanced in age. We think it was most likely a marriage of convenience. 
Uh, and it was short lived because within three to four months of their marriage, Eliza found out that Aaron was squandering her money. So she uh, started divorce proceedings against him. Now, how do they connect with tonight's story? Tom will tell you in a little bit more detail, but suffice it to say, Eliza and uh, her real estate dealings um, played a role uh, in providing land for the construction of parts of the old Croton Aqueduct. And Aaron Burr um, mm -hmm. played a role in creating one of the first municipal sort of water supplies for the city through uh, the Manhattan Company, which evolved into today's, today's Chase Bank. And so before I, I segue and introduce Leslie, just wanted to show you this really fun artifact from our collections. It's a cross section of one of those old wooden water mains. Um, and according to the plaque, the, the water main dates from 1800 and was dug up in 1949. So it's a really fun, tangible connection to tonight's story. Um, and so with that, I just want to invite all of you again um, to thank you for coming and invite you if you are in the area of Washington Heights to come visit us on site or uh, virtually for programs such as this. <clears throat> so I'm segueing to our first speaker of this evening, uh, Leslie U. Walter. Shown here about a month ago, I think it was, Leslie, you were at our, um, our ice cream social wearing this fabulous hat. Um, and it's very timely because um, I believe you said that this hat represents the old Croton aqueduct. So, um, so Leslie U. Walter has had years of experience, as she says, drinking bad water. She is a retired <laughs> public health dietitian who raised a family and drank from the tap in China for over 20 years. The Chinese public, uh, gets no reliable information about water quality. So when she moved back to the United States, Leslie was primed to think more about water from all sources and to rekindle an interest in local history. And that is how she landed on the board of the Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct. Please join me in welcoming Leslie to tonight's program. Thank you, Megan. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Megan, and our audience for expressing interest in such an everyday thing as drinking water in historic New York City. Tom and I are crazy enough about this topic to be on the board of the Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct. We're part of a group of volunteers who seek to protect the aqueduct in Westchester County and New York City. Now that can be a challenge because the aqueduct is invisible. It's a mostly brick lined tunnel, a bit taller than a man that runs 42 mostly subterranean miles down the east side of the Hudson River into Midtown Manhattan. If I could have the first slide up to the fifth slide now, that would be good. Um, in the Westchester section, most of the time, the only way you know the trail is there is by locating the dirt trail that runs on top of the trail, uh, on top of the tunnel. That historic greenway is now a very skinny 66 foot wide state park. The trail and the tunnel are what we the friends help look after. Now state parks workers and the parks manager really have a big job since the trail runs 26 miles down Westchester through villages and finally through the big city of Yonkers. Slide six, please. Uh, we sponsor free guided walks and talks, including inside the tunnel at Osning, which you just saw. And this slide, we can stay on for a second. We do produce these map guides, two sets, for Westchester, one for New York City, they're for sale online, as well as at the Morris Jumel Mansion. Uh, 
I do recommend these award-winning maps because you won't know what you're looking at otherwise. There are historic, uh, engineering, cultural, architectural features all along the way. Uh, our visitor center, next slide, is open on weekends and sits right on the trail in Dobbs Ferry. Whoops, we missed just There you go. And then the next four slides. Uh, we also encourage invasive plant removal cleanups. We're so grateful that our trail neighbors and a whole cohort of walkers, bikers, gardeners support our efforts every year. I'm now going to make two points about tonight's topic. That's slide 13. Uh, and 14. One is that this water system for a modern city rests on ancient technology. You might be reminded of Roman aqueducts from Tom's pictures, or maybe the water flow at Machu Picchu. It's gravity that moved water in those systems. And by the way, gravity still moves water up to the sixth floor of buildings in Manhattan. This particular aqueduct, the old Croton, used zero energy to transport water from 42 miles away to households on Manhattan Island. Now, the second perspective on clean water is to look at the non-potable water all around us here in the Hudson River estuary. Mark Kurlansky had a great book, it's in the bibliography, follows the plight of New York oysters to explain the trashing of this estuary, the Lenape, ate local oysters here for 3000 years. They left behind piles of shells. These piles are called middens and the commuter train lines that run along the shore into the Bronx and Manhattan every day, they all run atop acres of shell middens. Tom tells me you can still see an oyster midden in Croton Point Park, 38 miles from Midtown in the shore town of Croton on Hudson. That saga of clean non-potable water came to an end in the early 1900s when the oyster beds collapsed around New York City. So thankfully the city drinking water is still clean. Now slide 15, please. Tom Tarnowski has found compelling primary sources that will transform, I think, the way you look at the topography of Manhattan and the aqueduct trail. So happy exploring everyone. And I will turn this over to Tom. By the way, all my slides are from uh, either under the trail or right on top uh, on the trail. Uh, so this is Tom after 30 years as an editorial photo researcher for news media. And after playing with his granddaughter for a year, Tom got a temp job as a researcher again. The magazine was working on a feature about the history of the New York water system. He found it fascinating enough to make it his retirement hobby. He's been researching primary sources ever since and that was 2003. He is a very upstanding member of the Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct. So take it away, Tom. Hey, can everyone see the screen? Okay, thank you, Leslie. Uh, there's one slide before this, just to introduce myself to the audience. Uh, this, is a, this, is, this is Tom Tarnowski speaking. <laughs> it's con and I'm connected to the picture of that guy in the slide in front of you, giving a tour as we often do and have done in the past um, all, uh, on various sections of the Croton Aqueduct. And we can start our tour now and our talk about the aqueduct and early water sources in New York, which uh, were not plentiful ever, but always part of um, uh, streams and ponds and wells that first the Dutch and then the British <coughs> uh, built, uh, but without any way to get rid of the wastewater. And so as the city of Manhattan grew from the battery up towards um, the collect pond, which is shown in this illustration, all the water became polluted. The collect pond shown in this next slide is the uh, ovoid shape with the blue arrow pointed at it <clears throat> being surrounded by city streets as the city grew up around it. And so by the time of the Revolutionary War, the water was no, no longer potable. And we can look at the next slide. <clears throat> Aaron Burr in 1799, shortly after the revolution had ended, got a charter from the state of New York after lobbying. He and a group of businessmen uh, were able to get the exclusive charter or the charter to exclusively supply New York City with all its drinking water, uh, with the promise that they would supply clean water to the inhabitants of the city, which they did not really do. What they did was dig a few additional wells in the area of Chamber Street and, and pump that water into a small reservoir 
uh, and it was the same polluted water that New York had been drinking for years already. The uh, charter cemented the control of water by the Manhattan Company, as it was called, for the next 40 years to the detriment of the city. And we can go to the next slide. Eliza Jumel, another painting of her that we see here, married Aaron Burr, as Megan mentioned earlier, um, but only briefly when she discovered that he was uh, wasting her fortune uh, late in his life. <clears throat> and so she kicked him out of the Jumel mansion after, after a divorce and actual legal proceedings. We can continue further. Uh, this is a picture or an illustration of the reservoir as it appeared on Chambers Street um, in uh, the early 1800s. Uh, it's just about um, across the street from where the Tweed Courthouse is now and about two blocks north of City Hall. Next one. <clears throat> Most people uh, who could not subscribe or couldn't afford to subscribe to the Manhattan Company's water delivery, uh, took their water from the tea pump, one of a few wells in, in New York attached to a pump that was slightly less polluted than the water av available from the Manhattan Company. And even at the price of a penny per bucket, it was the option, uh, probably the, the best option for most New Yorkers at the time. We can continue. Uh, here's a photograph of a, of a uh, hollow log uh, retrieved from the William Street subway excavation in the early 1900s. And you can see the plug uh, held out on the end of it and another boring into the middle of it that would have been something bored by fire departments to get water from those hollow logs and fight fires in the city. Uh, the less known uh, couple of wooden, wooden mains that were dug up were discovered as recently as the 1990s uh, in Coenty Slip on the east side of Manhattan um, uh, near, the sh near the shorefront. Uh, next one. Because of the polluted water, cholera as a dread disease finally arrived in New York in 1832 uh, while the city slept at the switch, according to this illustration. Uh, we think that the uh, disease arrived on ships um, and its intestinal infection spread very quickly among New Yorkers in 1832, killing approximately 3,000 New Yorkers out of a total population of less than a quarter of a million at the time. Uh, it was an intestinal infection, infection that could dehydrate a victim within 24 hours and cause their death. If they were infected in the morning, they could be dead by midnight. So it was a horrible disease uh, and led to many people leaving New York City in 1832 for the uh, country-like atmosphere of Greenwich Village at the time. Uh, this is a, a summary <clears throat> or an excerpt from a letter by a gentleman named Peter Hasty, a Scottish immigrant uh, who in 1832 was in New York uh, and as he says, was then the headquarters of the cholera and he could have fled but thought it better to face the dreadful scourge in a place where I could command assistance than to flee before it in the hopes of avoiding it and thus run the risk of having to stand the encounter single-handed. He also says he discovered some premonitory symptoms, uh, but never had a, a, a actual attack of the cholera. Remember Peter Hasty's name because we'll be referring to him to him uh, in a couple of more slides later on. We can go to the next one now. We can. Uh, not long after the cholera epidemic, about three years later, most of the Manhattan business district burned down in a winter fire in 1835 because of the poor water supplies and low pressure available from the Manhattan Company water mains. They were not able to control the fire. It ended in some loss of life but half of the business system, half of the business buildings in New York burned down and most of the insurance companies that insured them were driven out of business. And as a result, well, we can go to the next one. Uh, this is an 1820s painting depicting kind of the uh, socially riotous conditions in the Five Points neighborhood of New York City, 
which would today be uh, kind of in the area of Foley Square and Chinatown. It was a poor, what we would call a, um, a very poor down at the heels neighborhood, uh, a large center of immigration and minority culture. There are racist sentiments in this painting that are pretty obvious. Uh, showing Chinese, American Blacks, and poor Irish, uh, and pigs roaming the streets, uh, feeding on the filth that was in the streets at the time. It was a, a fairly scary neighborhood to be, uh, to be a, a part of. And anybody who uh, lived near it probably didn't want to be too close to Five Points. We can go to the next one. Here's a, a, a summary of um, epidemics in New York, ranging in early epidemics uh, in the early 1800s when yellow fever and smallpox took toll, toll, the toll of lives in the hundreds of people. And then the sharp spikes near the left show the 1832 cholera outbreak. It says here that 3,513 people died of the cholera at 1832. And then within a few years of that, there were also measles, scarlet fever, smallpox and more cholera outbreaks, uh, which gradually, gradually tailed off uh, after the introduction of Croton water in 1842. You could see all of the diseases uh, that were uh, um, epidemic at the time were constant uh, before, before um, um, penicillin and, and other uh, you know, bacterial treatments. Uh, gradually tailed off as the water got cleaner. And that only happened as more and more buildings in the city hooked up to the Croton water. Probably a course of 30 or 40 years. <clears throat> now there was racism in the country at the time, but there was also some, ex some sentiment in New York City in this Board of Assemblymen excerpt from the year 1839, uh, a, an assemblyman goes on about our country being so vast to so vast an extent and so abundant in resources when all who are willing to labor can find employment in the various works, both of public and private enterprise constantly in progress, the continued increase by population of population by immigration is not to be regretted. And he goes on to say uh, that people did take advantage of it but yet the great body of immigrants have added to the public wealth and aided greatly in the extension of public improvements. And goes on to say again, that there is within our land ample room for all, for all who are willing. We can contrast this 1839 New York sentiment with sentiments that we hear today, arguing about the same, um, the same uh, immigration uh, numbers that, that some people don't think are, are allowable or a good idea. But again, I think New York is in the lead again. And some of these same sentiments could be said by a current New York City Councilman almost word for word. Uh, next slide, Megan. So the um, Croton Aqueduct as built was seven and a half feet wide, eight and a half feet high on, its, on the inside, reinforced with stonework on the outside, lined with mortared brick on the inside, and designed to carry as much as 70 million gallons of water a day. Although originally it carried probably no more than 10 or 12 million a day, um, you know, when it was first introduced because houses had not yet been hooked up to the water mains that were being laid in the city for that purpose. And we can continue. Uh, this is an artist's depiction of an actual architectural drawing showing a variation in the, in the construction of the aqueduct as it would have been built when tunneled through earth. And there were hillsides where there weren't too many rocks in the way, where the form of the aqueduct took a more uh, curved shape, a more complete arch from bottom to top. And the two drawn figures on the top are building bricks around wooden formwork, uh, which was probably a standard form that was used so that the various contractors building the aqueduct could all use the same shapes and sizes of forms. And in the individual sections they were building, they could actually meet and hook up the aqueduct uh, so that each section would meet uh, accurately. We can continue. John B. Jervis was the chief engineer after the original chief engineer was fired uh, after having done a numerous 
uh, surveys to chart the course of the aqueduct, Jervis was hired because he was known to the city fathers as a can-do kind of engineer, already responsible for building numerous canals, including the Erie Canal on which he learned to be an early civil engineer. And so this picture uh, from the Jervis Library in upstate New York probably shows him at about the time he assumed the job in New York in 1837. Uh, of the workers who worked on the Croton Aqueduct, some were skilled, such as this mason, showing wielding a five pound hammer. I've tried this, it's almost impossible. These men were built of iron to be able to hammer rock all day. Uh, and this would have been in one of the skilled workers um, carving the stones that had to be somewhat more in somewhat more finished condition than, than the rough stone work in the aqueduct. Another worker uh, intrinsic to the success was a surveyor. And uh, here's a, an early surveyor shown with the tools of the trade, an early sighting scope, which was fairly elaborate and sophisticated for its time, a uh, square or a ruler, a compass and some charts. And that's pretty much all they had to work with other than surveying chains, which would measure out a specific length of, of uh, path that would then have to be cleared by an ax man. Uh, so a, a surveying party would have an ax man, a surveyor, uh, and a chain man. Once the aqueduct was in operation, the various fire departments in New York, all of whom were volunteer at the time, uh, had access to water under pressure and through these early fire hydrants, which you can see here. Uh, to, and the, the pressure in the water mains by 1842 uh, were, was enough to raise water through fire hoses to the top of a five-story burning building. Uh, aiding the insurance companies who promoted and um, uh, advocated for the aqueduct uh, and keeping down the loss by fire in the city at that point. Uh, and Peter Hasty appears again here as a resident engineer on the Croton Aqueduct. In this 1841 letter to his relatives in Scotland, he talks about the aqueduct being upwards of 40 miles long, divided into four divisions, and his was the fourth, or that next to the city, embracing by far the heaviest and most important part of the work. And of course, <clears throat> he's right about that. Most of the larger and heavier structures and difficult engineering was from the High Bridge down to 42nd Street. And this, of course, he esteemed an honor. The emolument is not great. I like the emoluments clause, <laughs> but it's enough for all my wants. The engineers, my associates, chiefs, and assistants are better men than I can reasonably hope to be employed with again. And then he makes a reference to the steamships plying the Atlantic, kind of calling attention to the um, Industrial Revolution hitting its stride as steamships kind of took over the, the routes of sailing ships across the Atlantic. This is a profile of the Croton Aqueduct in Manhattan from the Harlem River on the left, which is shown as a deep chasm, and then making its way south through Manhattan, across Manhattan Valley, another uh, depression where the aqueduct was converted from a brick tunnel into iron siphon pipes, and then down to 42nd Street, which shows as a blue rectangle about midway in the, in the chart, where a distribution reservoir uh, was on a high point in the city and was able to distribute water to elevations below it farther down in the city. And that the elevation gave the water the pressure in the pipes to deliver the water to the fifth floor of any building south of the, uh, of the either reservoir in Central Park or the distribution reservoir. <clears throat> Years later, when technologies had uh, improved somewhat, they were still digging through solid rock to build aqueducts for New York City. This, this being the Catskill Aqueduct, much of which was bored through solid rock. Um, in 1910, they had the use of steam power drills, as well as the utilization of dynamite to blast the rock out of the way after they had packed the uh, steam power drills bored holes with dynamite and blown them up. It made the work go much faster and a little bit safer than the black powder they might have used a uh, hundred years before. 
uh, much of the aqueduct, uh, when it's not on, on a grade level, has to be built up across short valleys. And this is a uh, Indian Point Brook or the Indian Point uh, overpass um, up here in uh, Westchester through which uh, the aqueduct was built on top of a 40 or 50 foot high stone wall. The uh, raised embankment walls could be anywhere from a few feet up to 70 or 80 feet high in order to keep the aqueducts uh, water flowing downhill by gravity uh, at an inclination of 13 inches per mile. And a gatehouse in uh, New York City would have been used to convert the brick tunnel into iron pipes. And this would have been a gatehouse where that happened. The brick um, aqueduct was converted into, as planned, four pipes, but only two were built at first, uh, covered by control gates that measured about 18 inches wide each. And it took two gates to open each 36 inch wide pipe. So the water could go downhill from the, in the siphon to 125th Street at the low point in Manhattan Valley, and then be pushed by the water behind it uphill again to the high point at 119th Street, where it would again be converted to the brick aqueduct, not under pressure. And similar <coughs> um, things that you see on the aqueduct even today are these ventilator towers which are basically chimneys open to the aqueduct that allow water uh, air to enter and escape the aqueduct, thereby um, uh, kind of equalizing the air pressure between the outside air and in the aqueduct itself. And they're built about every mile along the aqueduct in Westchester. They used to be in New York City as well, but they're all gone now. Uh, stream culverts had to be built, 114 of them in total to allow natural streams to pass under the aqueduct. And you can see the cut stone in this aqueduct in Hastings on Hudson uh, doing the job it, had, it was built to do 180 years ago with almost no maintenance to it, still, still doing what it was designed to do. Uh, there were road culverts as well. Here's one in uh, North Terrytown, an area now known as Sleepy Hollow uh, that was wide enough for one horse and carriage to go through with the advent of automobiles in the early 1900s uh, became a dangerous tunnel because automobile drivers didn't have the sense that horses did to stop before they were about to crash into each other. And many accidents occurred when early drivers tried to race each other towards the tunnel under the aqueduct. Uh, serious accidents did occur. And we can go to the next. Here's a view of New York City looking south from Union Square Park. Uh, we call this a bird's eye view. And Union Square Park used to be an oval shape with a 100 foot wide fountain in the middle of it, which was built as a memorial to the introduction of the Croton Water in 1842. This was about the northern reach of the city in 1842. 14th Street would have been, in this picture, this illustration would have been done seven or eight years later as the city grew farther north. Uh, the city uh, continued growing and this 1861 illustration shows the corner uh, looking northward from 42nd Street and 2nd Avenue, showing how as the streets were graded for development, some of the older buildings ended up being left uh, kind of on high rock outcrops on which they were built, much of the rock being removed to grade the streets. And I assume this is a fairly accurate illustration. It appeared in Valentine's Manual, um, a city manual that was published for 20 or 30 years and reported on all the city's progress. And by the 1870s and 80s, they were building water mains, uh, more numerous water mains to deliver water to the city this is on probably Amsterdam Avenue after they knocked down an above ground section of the aqueduct. And you'll notice a sewer being built on the right side, the brick structure. They built the sewers and the water mains at the same time uh, as a way to dispose of all the water they were delivering to the city. Unfortunately, most, most of that waste was delivered to the East River and the Hudson River and led to the collapse of the oyster beds that, that uh, Leslie was talking about earlier. 
The Keeper's House in Dobbs Ferry is our 1857 Italianate brick house. Uh, five or six were built for keepers on the aqueduct, those being employees of the Croton Aqueduct Department. And each keeper was responsible for a six to eight mile long stretch of the aqueduct, uh, guarding it, maintaining it, and reporting any injury to it, including keeping farmers' cows off the aqueduct uh, who, who uh, the farmers would let their cows graze on the aqueduct grass. And we can continue. Actually, if we could just pause um, for a sure. second, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, um, we do have a question here about um, how was the construction for the Croton Aqueduct funded and how is the land um, acquired? Uh, the, quick, the quick answer is bond sales. The city sold bonds, uh, seven or $8 million worth of them, which were avidly sought by investors. And the land that was needed for the aqueduct was taken in by what we would call today as eminent domain. Yeah. Uh, it led to a lot of court fights and a lot of arguments with landowners who demanded more money for their land than it was actually worth. And some of the lawsuits continued for 50 or 60 years, even after the aqueduct was built. Okay, great. Um, and also, we're um, we're seeing some activity in the chat. Um, there are some uh, people who have had the opportunity to enjoy hiking the old Croton Aqueduct Trail, yeah. all forty-one miles, right. um, or bikers. Um, yep. And then Leslie's promoting um, that you can uh, walk either section and get a badge from the friend. If you walk all forty, if you walk all forty-one miles and make that claim to the friends of the old Croton Aqueduct on their website, we will send you a badge with the number forty-one on it. Nice, and it's the honor system. It is. So, so we trust. We know that all hikers are honorable. <laughs> Great. Um, just wanted to let you know that you've got about eight more minutes. Sure. So, all right. We can, we can wing through some of these in about 15 seconds in, in that case. This is an illustration of the original Croton Dam. Uh, it was built in two sections and the original stone faced section on the right was the original part. The stone faced section on the left with a curved face uh, was built in 1842 after an earthen embankment washed out almost immediately after the aqueduct uh, was finished being built. And we can continue. And I love the description of the aqueduct as being in the wild region of the Croton at the time. And this is from an 1842 book about just that. There were probably more farm animals than people in Westchester and Putnam counties at the time. And it was a wild region relative to the rest of the city. We can continue. Here's a picture of the Croton Dam shortly before it was submerged under a new uh, under the waters of a new dam built three miles downstream, and that would be called the New Croton Dam. This photograph is interesting, not only because it shows the curved face of the dam, which broke the force of the water, but it also shows the gatehouse through which the water was directed into the brick tunnel. And here's the New Croton Dam, three to three and a half miles south of the original. This water, uh, this dam is... Uh, shows about a hundred feet of its height, of its 200 foot height. Half of the dam is actually buried below the plaza downstream of the reservoir. And it in increased the impoundment, impoundment of Croton water in the reservoir by a factor of 15 from 2 billion gallons to 30 billion gallons uh, within a year. And it still exists today worth a visit. This is a map uh, showing the same sections on the right in the blue shaded areas is the original uh, Croton Reservoir or Croton Lake. And on the left side, it shows the uh, enlargement of that reservoir with the construction of the new Croton Dam and it's 30 billion gallons. Now, as soon as the water was introduced into New York, it was wasted. Um, Mr. Hasty, who again appears here as a resident engineer says that 15 or 16 million gallons of water was being delivered. And this was about 1845 or 46, but that the actual use of the water is about one half of what was delivered. The rest was wasted 
in houses by generally profuse and lavish application, and particularly in the offices, stores, and public houses where it is deemed necessary to keep it running day and night for the purposes of purification in summer and to prevent it freezing in winter. And we must remember that houses did not have uh, central heating at the time when they let their wood or coal stoves go out at night. The temperature in a house and its plumbing could often go below zero and burst the pipes. So they did have a reason for leaving water on in the winter, at least a drip. I know of people who still do that today, but although not in New York City. Uh, here's a, a chart showing the increase in consumption uh, of water as well as the increase of population in the city. In 1842, about 12 million gallons a day were used. And as more and more people hooked up, the use of the water increased exponentially so that by 1870, 77 million gallons, the maximum capacity of the old aqueduct was reached. And then they continued to increase it even more, causing maintenance problems like cracks in the bricks and leaks, which had to be uh, repaired up until 1890 when the new Croton Aqueduct was built that could supply three times as much water to the city through a mostly subterranean uh, under pressure aqueduct. And then uh, continuing development of water sources for New York are shown in this map dating uh, from eight, 1937, showing the increasing sizes of water conduits as the water was increased um, uh, through the Catskill and the Delaware aqueducts from up in the Catskill mountains. So that, and the yellow uh, section you see is the, the uh, Croton watershed, which by 1910 consisted of a dozen reservoirs all interconnected to feed water to the Croton Reservoir. Uh, the Catskill and Delaware Aqueduct today deliver 90% of the city's water and New York City drinks about 1 billion gallons of water a day, which is less than it used to. <laughs> we uh, can continue on our trip through Westchester County by looking at this arched uh, bridge in Ossining through which uh, it delivered the aqueduct water over a steep gorge uh, originally, and that was completed fairly early in the construction of the aqueduct, and it, it can still be visited to get today, and it was renovated by New York State Parks a few years ago and is in excellent condition. It's also the place where you can go inside the aqueduct and see the bricks from the inside when we schedule tours. Here's what the um, aqueduct in Austin looks like today, the wooden trestle bridge having been replaced in 1861 by a brick arch, a road bridge underneath it, and the paltry amount of water that usually flows through the Sing Sing Kill can sometimes increase with a large rainfall or storms. We can continue, and here's the inside of the aqueduct outfitted for public view and public visitors with a metal grating for walking on and electric lights so that you can see where you're going. We will be getting, doing more of these tours in the future, I'm sure, having been uh, shut down by COVID over the last year. Uh, the highest embankment in the aqueduct is, again, in Sleepy Hollow, adjacent to the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. The uh, illustration on the left was done in 1842. The photograph on the right of the same uh, stream culvert called the Pocantico River is what it looks like today. Uh, and again, uh, an up above view, an aerial view of that same section showing how high the embankment was uh, with guardrails built in for pedestrians to tour the aqueduct uh, across the long valley where it, where it was built uh, in Sleepy Hollow. If I, if I could just jump in, um, yeah. Tom, we've got a lot of questions coming in on the chat. Um, uh -huh. So if, if um, it's all right with you, if I could just ask you some, and then perhaps we could um, go to different places in the slideshow that kind of sure. hone in on those. Um, yeah, we can, we can jump down to Highbridge right after this. Um, so Alan has a question. Um, Full disclosure, he's one of our all-star docents um, uh -huh. asking about the Jumel property uh, acquired yes. for the initial construction. Um, right. He wants to know what Eliza was paid. Was it voluntary on her part? Anything else you can tell us about the aqueduct and the Jumel property? 
we will be getting to that uh, when we talk about the hybridge and the Jumel property. But let me say that she tried to get tens of thousands of dollars from the city for seven acres of her land adjacent to the hybridge when the city in 1864 was planning to build a high service waterworks there so that water could be pumped from the level of the aqueduct up to the height of the ele higher elevations in, in Northern Manhattan. She thought that her, um, her seven acres were worth, if, if they could be broken down into 25 by 100 foot lots, that they should be sold for $650 each for that seven acres. So I didn't do the math on that, but it adds up to tens of thousands of dollars. The city rejected the original offer. I don't know what they paid her in the end, but it was probably more than they wanted to, knowing <laughs> Eliza Jumel. She drove a hard bargain. Uh, yes, she did. <laughs> and, and she then, was not to be taken that? advantage of. Nope, not by Aaron Burr or the city of New York. Um, <laughs> and then Leola has a question about how were the bonds that funded the original aqueduct paid back? Gradually. <laughs> but but the, uh, the uh, amount of them did not bankrupt the water department once it, uh, the Croton Water Department uh, took control of the aqueduct upon its completion because every time they, they signed up new customers uh, and hooked them up to the water mains, which were being laid, they collected an annual fee from each subscriber. And so the annual fees as they got, you know, in, into the thousands and then tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands did, did provide enough money to pay back the bonds. And then one more question before we, we scoot down to the high bridge. Um, sure. Uh, let's see. Mario has a question about the new dam. Um, uh -huh. Why uh, is the overflow section, quote, stepped down for the new dam? The new dam, uh, it does have an overflow. It does have a spillway. Mm -hmm. And we'll show a picture of that in the end. Okay. Um, but there, there, there is water that spills over it continuously. Uh, in years past, the state did not require the river below the dam to be kept running, but because of environmental concerns now, they do. Mm. And so a certain amount of water has to be allowed out of the Croton Reservoir to keep the Croton River flowing for the approximately three miles down to the Hudson River. Great. Uh, you're such... You're such a wealth of information, Tom, and, and our audience. Keep those questions and comments coming. <laughs> shall we shall we scoot down to Harlem closer sure. to the city? All right. There we go. Oh, here there's, we are. There's the high bridge. <clears throat> this is a, a depiction of the high bridge as it would look from a from a FB Towers concept in 1842. He was an engineer and knew what the plans were. And so even though the bridge had not yet been built, he knew what it would look like um, by 1848 when it was finally finished. And this shows a bucolic, uh, more than bucolic, rural countryside of, uh, the north, of the Bronx on the right, or what was then Westchester County and Manhattan Island on the left. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite passages from any first person anecdotes it's the diary of a nine-year-old girl in 1855 talking about family history and her mother telling her that the Manhattan water was brackish and not very pleasant to drink. But she also describes the high bridge uh, as a, a July 4th uh, trip that her father got up to take her and family uh, out to see it. And this is when it was complete. It is built with beautiful arches and brings the Croton water to New York. My brother says he remembers riding to the place where the Croton Aqueduct crossed the Harlem River by a siphon before the bridge was built, and that is true. And the man in charge of it opened a jet at the lowest point in the siphon and sent a two inch stream of water up 100 feet. Um, then I wanted to skip over that part until the bottom there on the right page, where she says her mother, her grandfather had ships that went to Holland and he brought back skates to his children from Holland and they used to skate on the canal that is now Canal Street. So imagine skating on Canal Street now. You might be dodging a few taxi cabs. And here is an illustration by F.B. Tower 
The Jamel mansion is shown at the left under the arrow up on the ridge. You might recognize the uh, kind of Roman arched, the Roman uh, pediment and columns. And the, the uh, white plume in the background is the plume that uh, Catherine Ann Havens referred to uh, being used as a demonstration while the bridge was being built. And again, the bucolic nature of the neighborhood, uh, the mainland as they referred to Westchester and the island of Manhattan, still fairly thickly wooded on the, on the uh, steep ridges of the Harlem River. Uh, something that shows the untamed nature of the city even then, anywhere above its built-in sections, uh, talks about a resolution uh, by the uh, city assembly authorizing the mayor to hire people uh, to be paid and for persons who shall regularly be appointed to kill and destroy dogs running loose at, or at large in the city below 30th Street. Uh, and they were uh, given a bounty of 50%, 50 cents for each dog destroyed. I think as the city grew north, they changed the language in this resolution to 40th Street, uh, 42nd Street, because the city had grown up or was growing up that far north by the time this resolution was passed. So it gives you a, a, a little sense of the brutal nature of the, the 19th century. Things were not nice all the time to people or animals. And here's an 1850s uh, illustration showing the high bridge after it was built uh, and the horse and carriage in the foreground as we look north are about to cross the original Macombs Dam Bridge, which uh, neighborhood folks might know as 155th Street today. Again, still bucolic. <laughs> by, the, by 1861, a large 90 inch water pipe was being added to the top of the high bridge. And this photograph uh, that I found at the Library of Congress and with the help of one of their archivists shows the pipe being added, a big cast iron pipe with lots of bolts. The contractor who built this pipe, after he uh, completed this project, he went back to Greenpoint, Brooklyn and built the Monitor ironclad warship for the Civil War battle of the Monitor and the Merrimack. And that Monitor was built in Greenpoint. Uh, in 1927, the pipe was uncovered again when five of the piers and arches of the high bridge were being demolished. Um, we can see the open uh, deck of the high bridge. And you'll notice that the Bronx in the background is no longer bucolic in 1927. It has become an urbanized part of the city uh, with apartment houses built one after the other over a period of 20 or 30 years from the early 1900s until uh, 1927 when this picture was taken. Okay. Um, so I think we are almost at time. Um, oh, but we didn't do we didn't do Eliza Jamel slides uh, yet. Well, but, well, maybe we'll have we'll have sort of a a bonus uh, section. Okay. Um, but uh, Leslie has been responding in the chat about how the high bridge had been closed for over 40 years. Um, it's the oldest yes. standing bridge in New York City and the only pedestrian bridge that's always been a walking bridge. It opened again five years ago, just five minutes from the Morris Jumel Mansion. And that's probably um, a good segue into, you know, how can people... Um, you know, what kind of programs and activities are you all having during the pandemic um, at the Friends of the Old Croton Aqueduct? And how, how can people learn more and get involved? Oh, I think by our, by our aqueduct website, aqueduct.org, A-Q-U-E-D-U-C-T.org. And viewer, people who would sign on to that page should find reports about activities or planned tours that we, we will be putting together. And some of those tours uh, sometimes swing by Morris Jumel Mansion. So they you might do. be able to do a two, a two for one. Yes, <laughs> a visit to the High Bridge and, and to Morris Jumel is an excellent tour. Ah, and Robin in the chat is saying <laughs> this photo shows the Harlem Speedway, a New York City taxpayer funded horse racing lane and uh, they do a special tour of this Horses in the Heights. Oh, I like the title. Yeah, if you, then collect, we have, in, if you then collect we have, down one or two um, 
photos that you go on the speedway right there, mm -hmm. early 1900s. And then the next slide is even more interesting because it shows a woman in white piloting one of the carriages on the speedway. Maybe uh, a, a trendsetter in her generation, just like Eliza oh, Jamel man. was in her time. Exactly. Uh, um, so um, it is 8.01. Um, and so I think we are going to um, come close to oh, hot horses and hot women in the Heights. Wow, Robin. <laughs> nice. Um, I think we are going to um, conclude if you would be so kind uh, with sort of Eliza's land dealing uh, and that any questions that haven't been addressed in the chat, um, we'll be sure to save those and send them on to the panelists. Um, and you'll also be receiving um, a follow-up email tonight featuring um, a link to additional resources on this topic, um, as well as to a brief survey. So, sure, Megan, if you want to click down two slides, I think there is one there referring to, here's a map of the Jamel property mm. with the aqueduct uh, closer to the river as a parallel dotted line. And you can see where it's near her property. And if you click down one more, mm -hmm. I think you'll see a citation about her pro oh, here's the uh, reservoir and tower built adjacent to the high bridge on the seven acres purchased from Eliza Jumel. Although we don't know how much she actually got right. in the end. To be continued, research can continue. Indeed. Um, and then that's the, is, that's the high bridge today. It is a current, a current view. So it's, it's gorgeous. If you haven't had the opportunity to investigate that, there's also a, a lovely park um, nearby as yep. well. Um, do you, do, as we conclude, um, I'm curious to know, Leslie and Tom, do you have a favorite um, spot that you like to visit on the, the Croton Aqueduct? Is there a particular site or structure that really resonates with you? The New um, Croton okay, Dam. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, no, the New Croton Dam for me, and I don't know what Leslie's might be, possibly High Bridge. <laughs> yeah, I love the High Bridge because it's a neighborhood gathering center. And the other place I like is, for instance, to walk up in Westchester and then go off trail. People should explore not just the trail, but what happens off it. You can take many side trails, summer parks, summer trails, summer county parks into the towns. That's what makes the aqueduct trail more interesting to me. And of yeah. course, the fascinating stories, some of which um, you both have brought to light of uh, uh, people past and present uh, who have such a strong connection with the Old Croton Aqueduct, including yourselves. Um, so I would like to thank uh, both Tom and Leslie for a fascinating um, presentation on the Old Croton Aqueduct, sort of then and now. Um, I'd also like to thank my colleague Jesus for um, helping us uh, with the chat and the tech this evening. And I would also like to thank um, all of our lovely participants Thank you so much for your great comments and questions. And again, um, if, uh, apologies if we were unable to address all of the questions, but we will send um, any remaining ones to the panelists um, to reply. I'll be glad to answer anything that, that they have. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. And I hope you have a wonderful evening and a, a lovely rest of the week. Thank you all. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, Megan.